Okay, are we ready to begin? Yeah? Okay. I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to this roundtable on challenges facing Asian American and Pacific Islander low-wage immigrant workers. My name is Pat Shu. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. And I think this is um, one of the very first roundtables we've had on this subject at the Department of Labor. Um, so I welcome all of you. And now it's my really distinct pleasure to introduce somebody who probably doesn't need much introduction with this group, um, Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis, who is a friend to all workers, whose vision of good jobs for everyone is both um, imaginative and visionary and filled with her sense of heart and justice. It is really a pleasure for me to work for Secretary Solis and to work for this administration. Um, I don't have enough time to express and articulate all the ways that Secretary Solis, both as a Secretary of Labor and in her entire life, has been uh, committed to workers. Um, but for purposes of this roundtable, um, let me say that she was very involved in the El Monte case. Um, it was a case that happened in her district. She was well aware of these garment workers who really lived under slave-like type of conditions. Um, and it was um, her persistence and her in interest and commitment to these workers that a eventually led to, I think, um, a good result for them. Um, so without further ado. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, and welcome, everyone, uh, to the Department of Labor. So many of you have been working with us for many, many years, and in uh, my capacity as a former member and former state representative from California. But I think what brings us all together is the urgency of helping to focus in on this particular community, the Asian Pacific Islander community. And it's so appropriate that we're celebrating this month also uh, regarding uh, your contributions, your heritage, and especially to the viewers who are watching us right now. I want to uh, encourage them to continue to contact us at the Department of Labor, but also uh, when they hear from you, the panelists and the speakers, to be encouraged to get involved and to help us in our work as we try to move the agenda ahead in terms of talking about diversity, but uh, embracing that, and also talking about the workplace and safety. And I really want to commend our staff here at DOL and all the participants for coming today because it's an exciting time for us and we're challenged to try to do so much in a short period of time um, and I know that many of you are working very very hard we have worked uh, very very hard at the Department of Labor also to try to expand our outreach to different communities to diversify that message in different languages and being culturally uh, sensitive to how we do that that is so very important and I'm happy that now now is uh, someone sitting in the cabinet that I can reflect on on where we've been and where we can go and I and I certainly want to hear the breadth of ideas and suggestions and some of the things that you'll be talking about today I do want to I do want to mention that um, just recently I, I was in Immokalee Florida and met with a group of farm workers and students and people that also work very, very hard and don't seem to have a voice at the table either and are working very hard. And some have been exposed to slave-like conditions in the workplace. And because of language barriers or other issues, they're not able to uh, access services that we know here at the Department of Labor we can make available, but also to hear about the plight of the workers, not just in the fields, but in other service sectors where we find vulnerable populations and of course, much like the Latino population, the Asian Pacific Islander community is faced with many, many issues as well. And we want to be able to encompass that and work to come together to have more of a, I think, a plan that brings us all together, that connects us, not just when there's a crisis, but also to help celebrate the positive things that we're doing and hopefully plan ahead for future generations. And I see my friends here in the audience, and I want to do a shout out to Julie Sue, who was one of the lead 
attorneys in that tie worker case. And it really wasn't my doing that I accomplished much. It was the work of the advocates, uh, immigrants' rights groups, and also uh, at that time Department of Justice and others that took a strong interest in what happened in El Monte. 75, 70, uh, 72 tie workers, mostly women, were held in servitude for seven years. And there were uh, about a hundred other workers of Latino descent that were also uh, brought in each day to work, but it was like an encampment. And there was barbed wire inside the facility, so you could not leave the facility. These people were there as indentured slaves. They had to pay off their fare for coming to this country. They were mistreated. And a lot of what was embarrassing, I think, was that there were um, contracts that were given by major corporations to this subcontractor who then brought these individuals in, uh, unbeknownst to them, kept them there in slave-like conditions. It's a horrible stain in our U.S. history and what happened, but we know we, we have remedies, we have steps and actions to take. And I know now, because I've met some of the women uh, again recently and saw them here in Washington, they're advocates now. Many of them have their own businesses. They've become educated. They've also been able to become naturalized citizens. So, it, it, so out of a negative situation, there are some positive things that we can learn from some of the um, activities that go on with the help of organizations like yours and working with the federal government. So I, I just want to basically say that, that we're here to listen. You're going to hear from some of our staff as well. They'll be able to answer questions. Um, we are really ramping up our Department of Labor here, but trying to be friendly, accessible, and really understand the individuals that we need to be serving. And you, as our stakeholders, are a part of that, a, a part of that uh, mosaic to help us get this job through. So uh, we have a lot of people that are, that are here that are going to speak to us, and I know we don't have a lot of time. But I am very, very pleased uh, to introduce one of my good friends here who's visiting from the White House, and that's Tina Chin. And she is the director of the White House Office of Public Engagement. And I want to ask her to say a few words. Thank you, Tina, for coming. Oh, thank you, Secretary Solis. Um, uh, and thank you to all of you for being here and for those of you who are watching this on the webcast. Um, first, let me thank Secretary Solis. Solis um, and Patricia and the folks here at the Department of Labor for hosting this um, forum um, during here Asian American Heritage Month. Um, I think this is a perfect example of what we want to do during this month, which, which is to both celebrate um, the richness of Asian American and Pacific Islander um, culture and our community this month, but also to use it as an opportunity to raise issues of concern in our community and highlight those issues so that we can move forward on them. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, my colleague Chris Liu, who is um, the Cabinet Secretary um, for the President um, and for the Cabinet, who's joined us here and has um, been just a, a great leader and spokesperson for the Asian American Pacific Islander community in this administration. Um, and also, uh, Kieran Ahuja, who you will hear from later, who is now our executive director of the White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. And again, this kind of effort here at the Department of Labor is what the initiative is here for, um, and that is to make sure that the issues concerning Asian American and Pacific Islanders are addressed throughout the federal government. Um, she has an interagency working group. Um, that Department of Labor is part of and an active participant on um, that is working to identify those issues across the board um, and uh, will be actively working on those. And, and we have seen even just in the last recent weeks um, examples of how issues concerning the Asian American community need to be addressed in everything that we're doing. And I'm speaking, of course, of the oil spill going on right now in the Gulf Coast where um, the Vietnamese American community is especially hard hit. Um, the Vietnamese people who are in the fishing industry there have a particular needs, and I want to thank Karen and her staff, and you'll hear about more about it, for what they are doing to ensure that we are, um, have language-appropriate information and that we're doing a outreach to, um, and giving a voice to that community. And finally, thank you to everyone who's here. Um, you are all leaders and advocates, and I especially want to thank the workers who are here. Um, you are providing an important voice to all of our fellow members in our community who sometimes don't have a voice here in Washington. Um, and today is a really important opportunity to raise these issues, shine a light on them, make sure that we are paying attention um, to what's going on out there on the ground and that we as the federal government can have an appropriate response. So thank you all. Okay, I think what we'll do now is we'll just go around the table. If everyone could introduce themselves, we'll start with you, Chris. Uh, Chris Liu with the uh, White House Office of Cabinet Affairs. Tina Chen, White House Office of Public Engagement. 
I'm Karen Nahucha with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Beta Vita Sai, New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Karen Narasaki, Asian American Justice Center. Lillian Galedo, Filipino Advocates for Justice. Uh, Amato Uno Apala, the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. Young Shin, Asian Immigrant Woman Advocate. Nguyen Ding Tong with BPSOS. I'm Julie Su with the Asian Pacific American Legal Center. My name is Sokler, the Miss Current Interpreter for Clients on U. My name is the Country Visitor. Chad Rink with the Iron Workers Union. Hu Yong with National Jobs of Justice. Dua Tal with the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. Phil Tom, Center for Faith Based and Labor Partnership for DOL. Nancy Lebing with the Deputy Administrator of the Wage and Hour Division. Mary Beth Maxwell, DOL. Polly Gasaki, Mr. Review Board, DOL. And Nancy Chen, Women's Bureau. Almi Bermejo, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs here with the Department of Labor. Debbie Berkowitz with OSHA. And Gabriela Lemus with the Department of Labor's Office of Public Engagement. Uh, the format we're going to follow today is we're going to have a number of presentations by workers and then we're going to have um, some open discussion. Um, but, but before I introduce um, our first speaker, I just want to say and just take a moment to kind of um, feel the presence of everybody who's here and what a momentous occasion this is. Um, as many of you know, I was an advocate for many years and worked with Julie and Young Shen and others. And, it's so wonderful that we can have this kind of collaboration where we can really talk about what the issues are, the most pressing issues. And I just want to thank again the Secretary for creating a culture at the Department of Labor where, you re where outreach really means outreach. And it means outreach down into the details to really find out how we can work together. So thank you, Secretary. Um, our first speaker is going to be Ong Wu. Um, and let me just say a few words about him. He is a political refugee from Burma who resettled here in the United States in 2006. He has a wife and two daughters and two sons, um, ranging in age from 5 to 21 years old. He and his family live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After only being in the United States for two months, he started working at W&K Steel, um, a steel fabrication plant. And in September of 2009, he went on strike demanding fair and just treatment. His dream was um, the American dream, the dream that we have for all of ourselves and for our children with the opportunity of higher education and for him, for him and his family to live with re uh, respect and dignity and the same freedoms for all Americans. So, Mr. U, if you would please begin. Thank you. Uh, hello. Jamai Blakuya on U, Yagale Piyang Kong. Hello, I'm On U, a current refugee from Burma. I'm here to talk about the Chattai SCC. People who are in the country are not going to be able to do this. I was resettled in the U.S. in February 2006 through the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. I'm here to talk about the WNK is a deep community, a low in low care body. In May of 2006, I started working at WNK Steel, a steel company in Pittsburgh. Dine di go la da, geno a chalo da madu, ne da yin sayade, a low guy, a chee ne, lo cho se chamu masida, dread jump. Dim sabo geno la keba. Today I'm here to tell you about the unsafe working conditions that I and my co-workers have to face every day there. When it rains, the roof leaks and leaves two to three inches of water on the floors. Sometimes, I have to walk through it and everything becomes slippery. Biro Alo Yo Tema so you dare kung we pangadi malo lare at yet jump a low tema wale do mean ko chow set that mean ko na bangare malo long ne tang suniade a low domadi chano do la choke badi. I have seen a lack of exot phones at my job site. 
because we have no exhaust fans, we are breathing paint fumes, smoke from welders, and grinding smoke. This has caused me to get headache and sickness in my stomach. I can and, uh, also taste it in my mouth. It's cost me not only to uh, just one day for every day. In October of 2008, I had a bad experience at work when a saw table gave way. I don't know how much weight it can hold. The supervisor never told me. All of the steel is unloaded from trucks and stacked on the table. One day, I was on top of the stack to get a beam to cut. After I hooked the chains from the crane to the beam to lift it, the table gave way, causing the beams to fall. I grabbed the chains to keep myself from falling with the beams, keeping myself from being crushed and killed. If I was still hooking the beams when the table gave way, I would have been killed. Since I started at the UNK Steel in 2006 to the day I went on strike in 2009, I have never attended a safety meeting at WNK. I have never attended or known of any safety training classes that were offered by WNK. I never even heard of OSHA until I met with a co-worker, team, and chat. I also run three cranes at the plant. Sometimes when I have a load on the hook and I'm using the remote control, I cannot get the crane to stop moving. I have not been trained on its use or how to inspect the chains that I use or the crane to keep it safe. The company does not care about us. Now, I know that I have rights at work and that I am entitled to a safe workplace. All of these matters are related to worker abuse, human rights violations, and exploitation by men on men. That's why Tim, Chad, and I discussed these matters and went on strike. 
I would like to urge the authority concerned to put under your consideration and take an action as necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, sharing your story with us and for your courage and bravery. We um, appreciate it. Um, Dr. Thang is going to be our next speaker. Um, Dr. Thang arrived in the United States as a boat refugee from Vietnam um, in 1979. He, he graduated in 1986 from Virginia Tech, is that correct, right. with a PhD in mechanical engineering. And he also holds, holds an MS degree in elec electrical and electronic engineering from Johns Hopkins University. For 13 years, he worked as an engineer and a quality control manager at a research lab in Bethesda, Maryland. He holds several patents and has received numerous performance awards. Um, joining BP SOS, Boat People SOS, yes, uh, in 1988 as a volunteer, he left his engineer job in 2001 to become BP SOS's full-time executive director. Dr. Thang is known for his vision and bold actions. He responded to the boat people crisis in 1989. He established the Legal Assistance for Vietnamese Asylum Seekers, LAVAS, which set up legal aid offices in the Philippines in 1991 and in Hong Kong in 1992, is that correct? That's correct. To defend the refugee rights of the Vietnamese boat people. In 1995, he launched an advocacy campaign that resulted in the resettlement of over 18,000 former boat people from Vietnam to the U.S. under the Resettlement Opportunity for Vietnamese Returnees Program. He successfully championed the establishment and reopening of several refugee programs, such as the Priority One in Country Refugee Program, the Humanitarian Resettlement Program, and the Davis Amendment. Um, clearly, Dr. Thang is a, a visionary, um, and we're so happy to have you here to share your story with us. Yes, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I just came back from a long trip to Guam and Honolulu and then to the Gulf Coast. I was in Guam and Hawaii working on several cases of labor trafficking involving Vietnamese. Uh, so I would like to address that uh, at an, another time when we have the chance. Uh, but I come here to talk about the effect of the oil spill on the uh, Southeast Asian communities in, uh, in the Gulf Coast, including Alabama, uh, Mississippi, and uh, Louisiana. There are approximately about 40,000 Southeast Asians in that region, mainly working the fishing or seafood processing industries or derivative uh, jobs there. Most of them speak very little English. Many of them cannot even read or write in their native languages. And that's the, the reason why they migrated down to that area to work in the fishing industry and related industries that do not require a lot of English or literacy. Uh, if I have to describe uh, the this, this state of uh, that community now, I would say confusion, anxiety, fear. There's very little information available in their native languages, and yet there's a lot of misinformation um, that they, they have been subjected to. They, many of them have lost employment. For instance, in Alabama, Bayou Le Batre, that is the, the, uh, the seafood capital of Alabama, the last oyster processing plant was closed last week. So all the workers in those plants are now unemployed. Now BP has uh, operated its Vessels of Opportunity program. Many of these unemployed people have signed up. Few of them have been called on to do the work. But what I'm concerned about is that they have not been provided proper training including OSHA training. Quite a lot of them attended training in English. They didn't know anything about. They didn't understand a word of what was said, and yet they got issued a certificate of completion. So now they are deemed to be safe and ready to go out to work in a very hazardous environment. Uh, so that is uh, what uh, concerns me a lot. Two. Many of them are now unemployed, so they need some help. However, what they got is a lot of lawyers coming to town trying to recruit. 
Little did they know that litigation will take years, and yet they need to place food on that table the next day. And there's no program as yet. So we call on you. I know that after Katrina, there was the National Emergency Grant. Uh, as kind of interim uh, grants where people can get employed with nonprofits to, to do community service, and that might help a few. Um, extension of the uh, unemployment benefits. But more importantly, the fishing industry in that region is dying anyway. The oil spill only expedites the process, and yet there's no job training, job creation, job placement job preparation program that is tailored to their needs and to the challenge that they face, especially language access. Very few of our, the people that we have helped can enter into WIA-funded job placement programs because they don't speak the language. So they need some preliminary programs to prepare them. Uh, so I call on uh, the Department of Labor and especially Madam Secretary to focus on making sure that WIA-funded programs do serve the needs of this extremely vulnerable and disenfranchised and underserved and understudied population of Southeast Asians. And I would like to make a few recommendations here. One is that for eight to nine years now, OSHA has funded us to train a lot of Vietnamese-speaking OTI, that's OSHA Training Institute tra certified trainers. They are now across the country. They are not in the Gulf Coast. This is time to really make use of that investment of the, the last eight years. Bring them to the Gulf Coast, because not only we need certified interpreters, they need to understand the concept behind workplace safety and health. And you already have trained quite a few of them. So please bring them down to the Gulf Coast now. Second, the faith-based and community organizations in that locality, they are, by, de by default, they are the de facto first re responders. They are there. They have to do something for their own community. They have no choice. However, they do not have the resources. So they have used what have, the, what have they got already to help the community, but they need help. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, Dr. Tang, thank you so much for bringing all these points out there of, uh, as as you might know, of great concern to many of us here at this table. And I have asked uh, Debbie Berkovich, who represents our OSHA office, to respond to give you some insight as to what we're doing and what action. And certainly we want to uh, work with you to see how we can better the situation there in terms of interpretation and services at the OSHA, with respect to OSHA. So Deborah, if you don't mind. Yes, hi. It's so nice to meet you. And I'm sorry it took me so long to meet you. but. Um, I, you know, right from the very beginning of the oil spill, our first um, concern was the workers who are going to clean up the spill. Uh, we have a lot of experience in the agency from the Exxon Valdez and how we didn't do things quite right then, and a lot of workers are still sick from it. And then 9-11 and the first responders that happened there who also suffered lots of, um, you know, illnesses that came out later on because you know, we, we just, it was a learning experience. So the person actually running our operation down there has, came from Exxon Valdez and so was used to this. But we have, um, it was very clear to us from the beginning, you know, and this is um, a little hard for us because, uh, you know, we are doing this jointly with BP right now and we, that may not continue for that long. So we are in what's called compliance assistance mode. We went into it the day the spill happened. Eleven, you know, workers were killed and now, of course, nobody's even talking about them on the rig. So we have 21 compliance staff down in Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and uh, Florida at all the staging areas. And it was very clear right away that once the oil hit shore that workers Anybody who was employed needed four hours of safety and health training in a language they can understand and a vocabulary they can understand. So if they didn't read and write, you couldn't put slides up there and ask them to read and write it in whatever language. So, I mean, that's sort of our law. And so um, BP told us at the beginning, can I say this, that they only wanted to hire English-speaking workers. So we push back really, really hard and say, no, you can't. We got on the call with the governors and told them that we're going to insist that, you know, they hire local people. And so 
Then they brought someone on who was a Vietnamese uh, person who uh, held a meeting with the Vietnamese community. Our staff came, and I don't really understand how this happened, but they didn't speak the same dialect as the community members, and they were booed off stage. So we realized that this was a big problem. And so um, it, it's taking us a while, but our material is now in Vietnamese that we've just translated to get down there. And we insisted that BP last week translate all their material into Vietnamese. They said, can you do it for us? I said, no, you like run the world, you do it. And so uh, we gave them our translators plus the State Department's translators information. They have just translated their training into Vietnamese. Um, they held their first real four-hour training program yesterday, and we had a Vietnamese compliance officer plus the White House liaison was down there, as well as EPA sent somebody, and it was way too high literacy, and they got real-time feedback that this is not how you train anybody. Um, I, I want to tell you that, and we are, our staff is now meeting, they just met yesterday with members of the MQVN community, and so I think we're, and then we're also very worried about the fishermen going out on boats. Uh, BP has told us they're safe, uh, here are the levels that workers are exposed to for the, it's weathered oil out there, which means most of the hazardous chemicals should have already evaporated. But there are a lot of concerns, like in Huffington Post, that that may not be true. And BP has given us a lot of data. Um, but we decided we're going to get our own data. And so we're going out on the boats with the fishermen in Alabama and, New and Louisiana. And we hope to be out on them tomorrow. We're working this out with the Coast Guard, because you know our jurisdiction ends at three nautical miles. And then it's the Coast Guard jurisdiction. But we're in compliance assistance mode. So. You know, we're, we're sort of on top of this. And I'll meet with you afterwards, because it'd be good to meet together and to use your network to distribute all our material. But one thing I also wanted to say is we're aware of fraudulent training. So we are aware that companies are just training people and giving them cards without actually them being trained. And David Michaels, our assistant secretary, was on the phone today for three companies that we have heard that are, you know, where our compliance officer said, no, it's like an, nobody, everybody here speaks Spanish, it's in English. Or they're giving a 40-hour training in three and a half hours you know, 40 hours, three. It, so he's been calling them, saying that we're going to turn this all over to the state attorney generals. And so we are, we're trying to keep on top of this. But we hear you, and, and let's work together. And really, if, the, if this continues, we'll end up going into enforcement mode and start signing BP. So Thank you, Thank you Debbie. Well, one last comment I'd like to make, uh, Dr. Thang, uh, is that we are right now working as we speak on helping to provide uh, legislation so we can also assist those dislocated workers and folks that are out of work now. So we know how important this is. The administration's already worked with SBA to get uh, loans out to small businesses. And if you need any assistance in that, in that way, please feel free to call us. Our ETA uh, assistant secretary is Jay Notes, who's been on this from day one. And I would very much uh, like to have uh, more conversation with you so we can specifically address the needs that, you, that you're bringing to the table. But know that we're working very, very quickly, as fast as we can, and we know that we need, we need help from the community. They know best how we can address uh, their needs. So thank you so much for your comments. Thank you, Madam thank Secretary. You. You're welcome. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Liu, who's Assistant to the President and Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, for having me here and for your leadership uh, during your entire lifetime on these issues. Um, we've heard a very heartbreaking story from Mr. Wu, and I just wanted to open it up um, for some additional discussion. There are so many wonderful advocates around this table who I think um, have their own stories to tell, and obviously, the time being of the essence, we can't do that. Um, I'm just going to call out a couple of people. Julie, can I ask you, since uh, the Secretary has already talked about the uh, plight of the Thai garment workers. Um, if you could just, for those of us who aren't as familiar with that, just for a couple minutes talk about the type of conditions um, that, that, that existed for them and how you all used litigation as a strategy to help better their, um, um, their life. And given that time is sort of of the essence, if you can sort of keep it to about three minutes, that would be great. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, as um, Secretary Solis already mentioned, and as many people in the room are probably already familiar with, um, in 1995, 72 garment workers from Thailand were found working in an apartment complex in El Monte, California, where then Assemblywoman Solis, later Senator Solis, now Secretary Solis, um, uh, was the representative. And um, those workers were held against their will. They were trafficked into the country. 
country and forced to work 18 hours a day or more sewing garments for the nation's top manufacturers and retailers. So what they would do is get up at the crack of dawn, go downstairs, sew garments. Uh, d the longer, the, the quicker the companies wanted the garments turned around, the longer the hours that the workers had to work. And they were not uh, allowed to make any unmonitored phone calls or uh, have any uncensored um, letters. Uh, they were not free to come and go. They had to purchase all of their uh, basic necessities from a commissary that was inside uh, the complex. One of the workers became so ill with periodontal disease that he extracted eight of his own teeth. Um, many of the workers had undiagnosed illnesses. and. Um, I mean, there's so many heartbreaking stories. One of the, the women's, um, her mother, she was in El Monte for three years. Uh, her mother passed away a month before she was freed, and she never knew that her mother was sick. And um, only after uh, we met and we were helping them to make phone calls back to their families did she realize, you know, she wanted to speak to her mother first thing, and her mother was already gone. So she of often says that her mother died to, to free her. Um, and at the end of an 18-hour workday, they dragged their tired bodies upstairs, and they slept eight or ten to a bedroom made for two on the floor. Uh, all the windows were boarded, and workers talk about how sometimes a helicopter would fly over the apartment, and they would wave desperately out the little sliver of window that was showing. So that was a level of desperation, and their wages were less than a dollar an hour. Um, and after they were uh, finally freed, they were rounded up by what was then called the INS and uh, thrown into another federal detention center because they were not properly documented. And so that's when a small group of activists got together to, um, to, to help win their freedom. Um, and I think one of the m first and most important lessons of that, which I know the Secretary knows very well, is the critical importance of separating labor enforcement from immigration enforcement. Um, it absolutely pulls the rug out from under the Department of Labor and any labor enforcement agency to have any collaboration whatsoever with immigration. There's no question about it. Um, it simply reinforces the threats that employers make on a daily basis to workers who, who dare to complain. And we were able to get the workers free. And then, as, as Chris mentioned, um, my office represented them in a um, groundbreaking lawsuit against the not just their captors, but against the manufacturers and retailers that they were sewing for. And that gets to another point I did want to make, which is that Low-wage industries today, um, the, the traditional employer-employee relationship has really evolved in such a way as to obscure the real relationship between those at the top who control what's going on and those at the bottom who suffer through independent contracting, subcontracting, lease contracting, all kinds of ways that workers are no longer called employees and therefore written outside of the Fair Labor Standards Act and the right to organize and other sorts of labor protections. I know that our sister Baravi is going to talk about that. Very common in the taxi industry. It's common in the nail salon industry as well, where workers are licensed to, to be independent, um, where beauty schools open up. We had a case involving a beauty school where people were encouraged to come and learn. Instead, they were actually working in the school and not paid because they were paying for learning. Um, very, very common. And in California, there's over 400,000 licensed uh, manicurist nail salon workers, and a, a, a good, a, as many as 80% are Vietnamese, um, and tremendous self uh, so, uh, safety and health violations, toxic chemicals in, in that industry, a uh, whopping 95% or so are of childbearing age. And so these are women who are in really, really horrible circumstances where they might not be classified as the employees. Um, it also happens in the private caregiver industry, where workers are written out of protections because they're exempt from overtime protections under federal law. And so we saw that the need was not just to address the sweatshop operators, but to address the large companies who demand sweatshop labor, who perpetuate sweatshop labor. Um, and so that lawsuit resulted in over $4 million in settlement money that went to the workers and helped to um, help them to rebuild their lives. And as the Secretary mentioned, in 2008, we were able to get um, uh, legal status and actually um, legal permanent residency for them. And we celebrated with a, uh, with a um, uh, naturalization ceremony, um, actually, at my house. We celebrate every year, still in August. Every year we get together for what's called a freedom celebration to commemorate their, their freedom and their struggles and also the ongoing struggles of workers in the garment industry. That's really an amazing story. So thank you for all your efforts. Uh, we've talked a little bit today. Uh, Julie just highlighted the impact that litigation can have. We've talked about possible legislation. We've talked about uh, labor enforcement. Uh, but so many of you on the ground are providing, are on the front lines and providing day in, day out support, whether it's job training, it's um, language skill development, whether it's breaking down cultural barriers. Um, I just want to call on a couple of folks. I know, is it Julie? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lillian. 
Lillian Galato, uh, with the Filipino Advocates for Justice. I know your organization is helping to provide some of those services. Can you talk for a couple of minutes about what you all do? Um, we're working with two vulnerable um, sectors of the Filipino community. One are caregivers. Um, in Alameda County, there are a number of uh, private small group homes, uh, many of them actually owned by Filipinos and operated by Filipinos, that hire um, immigrant women, um, many of whom are um, not authorized to work, um, to provide um, round-the-clock care for their patients. And um, so we find that these workers are um, extremely isolated. Um, they're basically on call 24-7. Um, if they're sick, they have to try to find their own um, substitute. Um, you know, they're, they're very unknowing of what their rights are, what, what any prevailing wage might be. Um, in some situations, um, there's sort of a um, feudal relationship between the workers and the uh, owners of these um, home care situations. Um, they're recruited from the same part of the Philippines that the owners come from, and so there's this, um, you know, thing where you're all part of my extended family, I'll, t I'll take care of you. Um, in many situations, their documents are held, uh, or their passports, and so um, there's a lot of fear and a lot of um, um, se separation. I mean, there, there's no, there's very little way for um, for us to organize collective action um, because they are they're not in communication with each other. Um, there was also um, not too long ago a situation where a number of home care workers were recruited for a larger facility, and they were all housed in the basement of the facility. Um, this was in Santa Cruz, and um, and they were. Um, allowed very little time off and um, and could see people through the window of the basement, but they were not allowed to, to go out and get to know anybody outside of um, the building. And there were a couple of uh, union organizers who learned of their existence and tried to make communication with them, but but the fear factor was too, um, too high. Um, um, and I think that and I'd, I'd also like to make the link between um, those works, worker situations and immigration because I think we have to recognize that um, a large sector of our working population are part of the world migration of people, that in the global economy there's a sort of permanence of migration, and that we um, have to kind of pay attention to that, that um, there's kind of a movement underfoot uh, globally about the the rights of migrant workers, and I think that we're not paying any attention to that. Um, our our country is an assigner onto the UN Convention of the Rights of Migrants and Their Families. Um, most of the signers onto that are are the sending com countries, um, like the Philippines, Guatemala. You know these small countries that recognize that um, the the migration will continue, given you know how globalized our economy is. Um, the other um, sector that we work with are um, um, low-wage workers at the airports, and these are people who are wheelchair pushers, um, baggage runners, um, ticket checkers. Um, there's a lot of immigrants who hold these jobs in the Bay Area. Filipinos were about 60 percent of those workers up until 911 when um, they were brought, the, the, the screeners were federalized, and so most of them lost their jobs. Um, we continue to work with the people who weren't able to become screeners because they were not citizens and couldn't pass the new exam, but um, continued to work at um, jobs that were separated from the, the screener positions, and these are the ticket checkers and the baggage runners. Um, most of these workers are older workers. They're in their late 40s up until like 75 years of age. Um, they have to continue to work because they are relied upon by family in the Philippines as well as family here to continue to work. And um, this past year, one of our leaders in a, um, a worker-led organization that we have at the Oakland Airport died. Um, he collapsed on the job. And um, um, it was a good 20 minutes before 
an, an ambulance uh, whisked him off to a hospital and, and they didn't take him to the nearest hospital, they took him to a hospital that was farther down the freeway and he passed away the second day. So there's, there's n there wasn't a lot of training among the workers to respond. Um, and, um, and, you know, in this situation, people need to have more of a conscious um, training around health and, and safety on the job. Um, their wages, their hours are really irregular. Um, you know, it's, they don't know from week to week what, what days they're going to work, how many hours they're going to work that day. There is a health plan, but nobody can afford this health plan. It's like $500 a month, and sometimes they don't even make that much. So there's a lot of um, uh, irregulated going on. And I think we actually need to do some research about the, the home care industry to get more um, um, stories out in the forefront and to um, begin to strategize about how we're going to get around that. We're part of the Domestic Worker Coalition, um, working on a uh, state w level for a um, workers' rights. Um, uh, well, right now it's just a resolution. We're hoping to get some legislation passed at the state level, but we're also part of the National Domestic Workers Coalition, which I think has a relationship to the DOL. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lillian, for those comments and for your fine work. Um, to keep us on schedule, I'm going to turn it back over to Pat. But before I do that, let me just thank everybody here for your efforts. Um, you know, w when we established, reestablished the White House initiative, one of the questions we frequently got is, um, why do you need to have this initiative? Uh, because there's this perception that Asian Americans are all well-paid, white-collar uh, employees. And I think um, the stories that we've heard around this table and that we'll continue to hear are important uh, to dispelling that myth. So thank you all for what you do. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Julie, for your leadership on the El Monte case. It was really quite um, wonderful. Um, our next speaker is um, Beta V. Desai. And um, I can't even begin to um, elaborate and discuss all of her various awards, but you should know that she's been organizing taxi workers since 1996. Taxi cab workers are near and dear to my heart. We represented them, too, in my past life because they were all deemed independent contractors. <laughs> um, she co-founded and has uh, led the New York Taxi Workers Alliance since its inception in 1998 and today as its executive director. Um, so please tell us about um, your work. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Madam Secretary, I just want to say it's such an honor for us to be here and to meet you, and we're very thankful for this conversation. And joining me are two of my colleagues, um, Javid Tarek and Beresford Simmons, who are also leaders of our union. Um, as, um, as, as Julie and Patricia have already said, you know, taxi drivers in New York City are classified as independent contractors and throughout various cities um, in, this, in the country. And as a result of it, obviously, we're, we're cut out of collective bargaining rights. And although New York State, um, had, we've been able to maintain workers' compensation, it is the only employee-like benefit that taxi drivers still have in our state. But in many other states, taxi drivers don't are not even covered when they're injured on the job. And yet, you know, we, we are an industry, we are a workforce that, according to OSHA, the latest study, are 30 times more likely to be killed on the job than other workers. And that's really looking at, um, you know, deaths related to, to violence on the job. When you consider rates of accident, uh, those numbers, we believe, are even higher. And, you know, time and again, we, we rank among one of the most um, dangerous professions in this country. And I actually just want to say on this side, I really do want to commend OSHA that even though we as independent contractors are not covered under the act, time and again, OSHA in, in its um, research has always noted of the dangers on the job that taxi drivers face. And that, that's something that we're very thankful for. Because in our industry, it is a real struggle to, to recognize these issues. One of the reasons that we call ourselves the Taxi Workers Alliance and not the Taxi Drivers Alliance is because we felt it was important to say up front that we are workers, independent contractors or employees. It does not matter. Workers are workers are workers, and we all have a right to protection. 
The economic issues in our industry stem from the leasing system, which has been in existence since 1979. It basically means that the bosses are guaranteed a profit because taxi drivers begin every day at a negative of between $130 to $190 per, for every 12-hour shift, paying for the lease of the cab and the medallion and also to gas up for the shift. So they need to work on average about seven to eight hours of a 12 hour shift really just to break even before they can earn any money for themselves. If that car breaks down or if they're in an accident or if they're assaulted on the job and lose time, that is all money out of their own incomes. And um, although there are no, um, no wages and salaries in our industry, the economics is based on how much drivers earn through the metered fare, which is regulated. Um, and you subtract from that their operating expenses, which are the lease, the gas, um, maintenance of the vehicle, which averages about $8,000 per year to um, repairs on the vehicle, to time that they have to take out to bring that car in for inspection three times of the year, to, you know, every single thing has an economic cost to it. But the, but the garages and the taxi companies in our industry are paid up front. So the workers are not guaranteed an income, but the bosses are guaranteed profits. On top of it, you know, we have no health care. Um, there's, no, there's no retirement plan. There's no compensation for any kind of time off on the job. So we have seen time and again drivers who have gone from, you know, the hospital room, you know, from, from an injury to from, a, you know, um, a chemotherapy session to from, you know, a funeral for family members. We, we had a driver whose father was killed on the job and the taxi company refused to credit him for even the day of the funeral. You know, we see this time and again in this industry. And as a result of these economic pressures, and one of the reasons that the economic inequities exist is because we don't have collective bargaining because we're independent contractors. And so we can't sit at the table. Nobody's required to sit at the table with us to come up with the terms of a contract and to guarantee us some sort of even a minimum wage, you know, let alone a living wage or a self-sufficient income. So, um, and one of the major issues of, you know, back wages for us would be overcharges based on the lease that the companies collect from the drivers. Although the lease itself is regulated by the Taxi and Limousine Commission, our local regulator, um, many of the terms of the lease, many of the expenses that the companies are able to charge the drivers are not under regulation. And we actually happen to be one of the better cities because in various cities, like in San Diego, our, our driver brothers and sisters today are fighting for a lease cap at all, particularly in the absence of collective bargaining and the right to maintain a standard contract. We need regulation. We need regulatory protection, you know, since we are cut out of it um, as independent contractors. One of the things that we would really strongly call upon the DOL in your leadership to explore is the idea of forming a dependent contractor's labor board, something that will really protect the, the rights of the most growing segment of the American workforce, which is a tra the non-traditional worker you know, that is not an employee. And we would also call upon a real comprehensive study of the economics of our industry in particular. It is a very complex industry. We refer to it as a sweatshop on wheels, a mobile sweatshop. There are so many layers of ownership in our industry. There are so many categories that different drivers belong to. And all of this makes um, organizing, which is in the long run the only real vehicle for change that workers have, it makes it next to impossible. And so we would really call upon the Department of Labor, just as OSHA has looked at you know, um, safety where it has been so prevalent that OSHA has wisely 
you know, looked aside the, cat, the categorization of the workers and still recognized the risks that they are facing. We would say similarly when it comes to issues of economic inequity and econo economic justice, that we really call upon the DOL to, to also broaden its scope and look into industries which, where the workers may be deemed independent contractors or temp workers or whatever it may be, but in the long run they are still workers and they're facing great exploitation. Thank you. Could I just Thank add you. something? We are looking at the issue of misclassification and have uh, funds apportioned for that uh, to look at how we can help states begin, begin to look at that process, something that we all care very deeply about and know there's a lot of abuses. I also want to call your attention, and you probably were referring to this fact sheet that OSHA puts out on preventing violence against taxi uh, for hired drivers. So we are trying to make the most of getting this information out. We don't know if this is uh, available in other languages, but it's certainly something that we'll do. Okay, thank you so much for your comments. And, and also throughout the Department of Labor right now, we are looking at misclassification in each of the agencies as part of um, the department's plan, prevent, and protect plan, which you will hear more about, but it's taking a much more affirmative role in, in requiring employers to identify um, if they believe people are, are independent contractors. They basically got to prove it. Um, <laughs> So um, thank you very much for your comments. And now Young Shen, who um, is a force of nature, um, if, you, if you've known her as, as I have in, from the Bay Area, um, Young co-founded the Asian Immigrant Women's Advocates, AWA, um, where, where she is educated and trained literally thousands of Chinese, Filipina, Korean, and Vietnamese women working in the hotel garment industries as well as restaurant, electronics, and nursing home industry. She graduated from Hastings College of the Law in 1983 and is, is very well known um, among immigrant workers. So Young, please. Well, thanks for such a <laughs> great introduction. And first, I'd like to thank the Department of Labor and Secretary uh, for hosting this uh, round table. Um, uh, you know, for the last 26 years, Asian immigrant woman, ha uh, woman advocates has improved the working conditions of uh, AIPI immigrant woman workers, like what Patricia talked about, by providing education um, on labor rights and developing women's leadership to exercise their right and engage in collective action. So our approach has been the, really the education and leadership development and, then, and collective action. And in particular that um, women workers and they were uh, challenged and unsuccessfully demanded the corporate responsibility of government workers and which, you know, I have, you know, that uh, Julie has been part of. And uh, like El Monte case, you know, um, and then um, we also developed the ergonomic um, solutions to prevent workplace injuries among garment workers in 2004. And I'd like to call the attention to uh, also thank OSHA for providing, you might not know, <laughs> the through Susan Hard training that continued training uh, of the uh, ergo training uh, to the garment workers. And then I know that a lot of you talked about uh, how important to train um, the uh, culturally and linguistically competent uh, the uh, OSHA training, and that's what we are trying to do. So, you know, we certainly like to talk more about it. And uh, so, um, since my topic is uh, uh, where um, you know, AIPI uh, immigrant women workers, uh, as you probably know, they often work in small businesses in low wage, gender based jobs, such as, um, you know, Patricia already talked about, uh, and then also. Uh, that uh, Lillian talked about, seamstresses, electric assemblers, hotel maids, home care aides, packagers, child care, nail salon, and food service workers. And these gender-based jobs are characterized by repetitive tasks, low wage, and high uh, risk of job loss. Before I came here, I asked um, you know, our women workers what are their top concerns are. They said you know, they are very insecure about their jobs and they are scared um, because they suffer from low wages, long work hours, frequent layoffs and slowdown and workplace injuries without any recourse to the workers' compensation. 
And uh, briefly, I'd like to share some testimonials. And you know, la next uh, uh, mini uh, event like this, I love to see uh, more workers like uh, U coming and you know, multilingual, multicultural setting, so uh, workers themselves can uh, testify. But short of that, Miss um, Wang, uh, she talked about how she has worked at the restaurant uh, for three months without getting paid. And when she asked her boss pay, and the boss said, well, you know, when the business gets better, we'll pay you. And after three months, she finally had to uh, press it. Uh, she said that they would never voluntarily pay her. So non-payment wages is still alive. And, uh, you, you know, with education and leadership development, we are pushing it, but that's really the issue. And they get paid. I know that, you know, Lillian talked about dollar an hour, four dollars an hour. I mean, this is uh, like a sub-minimum wage we are talking about. And uh, Ms. Fong um, talked about um, she worked at a bakery for nine years. Her job involves the frequent lifting of the heavy boxes and pans and bags of ingredients and other items. One day she started feeling pain on, uh, the, below her stomach and found out she had a collapsed bladder. S and although the heavy, repeating, heavy lifting is a known cause for this condition, she paid uh, for this uh, surgery out of her own pocket because she was afraid um, she would lose her job if she asked for workers' compensation. So um, how can, I mean, there are more stories that you, I, you know, uh, we can talk about, but I know that I also like to talk about how can we improve um, these um, working conditions of the um, immigrant women workers. Uh, uh, what we believe at Asian Immigrant Women Advocate is uh, it needs to be a really significant and long-term investment. People talk about in, we want to do training, we want to do, but it really has to be systematic, significant, long-term investment in education, leadership development, and it has to be, we talked about culturally and linguistically competent. It cannot be just any leadership training and support for collective action in partnership with, uh, uh, with allies such as um, APALA and Department of Labor. Um, and we think these, uh, these uh, uh, approaches are key to improving these working conditions. Uh, through educational efforts, AA uh, immigrant women uh, learn about their rights. And then um, uh, through leadership training, they develop skills and competence to exercise rights, and we have seen that. And then working together uh, collectively to bring about the, you know, the in um, uh, partnership with uh, professional advocates, bring about the changes through campaigns, grassroots campaigns, uh, in low wage industries that hire AAPI garment workers. You know, I'm certainly happy to talk more about uh, the issues in future. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, our, our next speaker is going to be Amado Uno, who is currently the executive director of Apollo, which is the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, AFL-CIO, the first and only national organization for Asian Pacific American Union members. And their mission is to advance worker, immigrant, and civil rights. So please. Patricia, thank you uh, so much for that background and um, a brief introduction of, of our organization. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for your leadership to convene uh, this historic gathering. Uh, again, my name is Amado Uno. I currently serve as the Executive Director of Apollo. Founded in 1992, uh, Apollo's primary programs are built on three primary pillars, training the next generation of Asian Pacific American Union members, mobilizing the APA electorate, and strengthening labor and community partnerships. I'll be focusing my talking points on this last pillar. So as many of you know, a recent report by the Center for Economic and Policy Research found that Asian Americans and Latinos are the fastest growing groups in the unionized workforce and that two-thirds of APA union members are immigrants. So it is critical to recognize that when we're discussing the more than 755,000 APA union members in this country, we're also talking about a segment of the workforce that is primarily foreign-born. Furthermore, the study found a clear advantage for Asian American union members. For example, Asian American union members earn 9% more, are 19% more likely to have employer-provided health insurance, 
and are 25% more likely to have an employer-provided pension. Furthermore, this union advantage is greatest in the 15 lowest paying occupations. Thus, we know that unions provide a clear path to achieve greater economic stability for APA workers. We are also acutely aware that unionization is not the only path and that unions can and should do more to effectively engage APA workers. Apollo believes that strengthening labor and community partnerships is a critical component of our mission and we believe that we have contributed to building stronger bridges between organized labor and the broader APA community. One of the ways that we did this was last year. Borrowing a format created by our friends at Jobs with Justice, Apollo and the AFL-CIO organized the first national Asian Pacific American workers' rights hearing focused on the right to organize and the rights of immigrant workers. Asian Americans have been workers in this country for over 150 years, and yet in 2009, it was the first time that we held a national hearing on Asian Pacific American workers' rights. Co-sponsored by over 20 local and national organizations, some of whom are in this room, and shared by someone that the Secretary, who is probably familiar with, Congresswoman Judy Chu, as well as AFL Secretary Treasurer Liz Schuler, the hearing provided a national platform to highlight APA workers' stories. The participation of Mary Beth Maxwell, Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Labor, was also greatly appreciated. While the hearing profiled APA union members, there was also a very conscious effort to include non-union members, including excluded workers, like a domestic worker. And what we learned from this hearing is that APA workers face unique challenges and obstacles. In a forthcoming publication, Breaking Ground, Breaking Silence, several recommendations are laid out for the Department of Labor. One of these worker stories uh, was Brother Ong U from the Iron Workers. Another story was that of Ricky Lau, a Taiwanese immigrant uh, in the Bay Area. An electrician by trade, uh, Ricky worked for an NBC contractor, uh, NBC Contractors. NBC contractors received millions of dollars in uh, public works projects around the Bay Area. What many people did not know was that Ricky and many of his co-workers were forced to fill out two time cards. One stating that they worked uh, their true number of hours, which was 60 to 70 hours, and the other stating that they would work anywhere between 16 to 20 hours a week. What NBC Contractors was doing was stealing literally millions of dollars from Ricky Lau and many of his co-workers. People knew about some of these uh, egregious acts by the, uh, by the contractor, but there was difficulty in engaging Ricky and many of his co-workers. So through the leadership of IBEW, which is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, they hired a compliance officer that spoke Mandarin and Cantonese that was able to learn, uh, earn the trust of Ricky and some of his coworkers. As a result of their efforts, uh, we stand proud to say, st uh, we stand here proud to say that uh, the Alameda County District Attorney's Office filed 48 felony counts against NBC contractors and up to $5 million in backed wages. But we know that there are many other Ricky Lau's out there. And so some of the specific recommendations that we have for the Department of Labor is to encourage the department to use all sanctions available under the Fair Labor Standards Act against employers who, com who commit wage theft, including criminal prosecutions for pr employers who do so willfully, <laughs> to increase protections for workers who speak up and add tools that the DOL and courts can use to investigate cases and recoup money that workers are owed to provide increased resources to hire increased numbers of culturally competent officers to work directly with API workers and communities, to, pro to provide increased resources to ensure language access is a priority to educate and engage APA, APA workers, uh, to request all federal agencies and particularly the Bureau of Labor Statistics to collect and disaggregate Asian Pacific American subpopulation data to re-examine the one-stop shop models to ensure greater access for APA immigrant workers, and to reiterate what has been stated many times at this table, that we re-examine the misclassification of APA immigrant workers, specifically domestic workers, uh, taxi workers, and nail salon workers. 
So as we uh, examine some of these specific recommendations for the uh, Department of Labor, we also want to take the time out to acknowledge the incredible work that has been done here. We recognize your proactive and creative approach to protect workers' rights. Specifically, we applaud the We Can Help campaign to safeguard against wage theft, the OSHA summit focusing on Latino workers and health and safety issues in the building trades, which we know that they face some of the most dangerous work, dangerous work conditions in the country, for identifying a dedicated staff member like Cindy Chen, special assistant to the secretary, committed to uh, APA engagement. It is our um, understanding that if she is not the only um, individual within the department, she is one of the only individuals in, in any department dedicated to APA engagement, and I think that the Secretary deserves special credit for that leadership. And finally, for hosting this roundtable conversation on Asian Pacific American workers' rights. Looking ahead, it is our hope that the DOL would be willing to consider hosting a national summit on Asian Pacific American workers' rights. I know that many other organizations uh, that may not have access to this table are doing critical work to assist in this effort. At Apollo, we plan to convene up to six local hearings in the next year targeting New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Las Vegas, and Houston. Uh, we're proud to say that uh, Barvi is uh, one of the confirmed speakers at our New York hearing on June 5th. We invite the Department of Labor and your local affiliates uh, to fully participate in these hearings. The primary objectives would include to provide a space dedicated to examine workers' rights through a racial justice lens, to advance policy initiatives that strengthen workers' rights at local, state, and federal levels, and finally, to strengthen partnerships with, between the Department of Labor and Asian Pacific American labor and community organizations. We believe that these local hearings will build the needed capacity and interest to support a national summit focused on Asian Pacific American workers' rights. It should also be noted that APALA is organizing our next biennial convention from July 22nd through 24th in 2011 in Oakland, California, where we will mobilize hundreds of APA union members, allies, and workers. We believe this would serve as an ideal opportunity to, par to partner with the Department of Labor as well as, as well as many of our other advocates. In closing, thank you again for convening this critical, uh, this critical meeting. While we live and breathe Asian Pacific American workers' rights every day at Apollo, we are grateful for the opportunity to share our thoughts with you during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Furthermore, we hope to be able to continue to find innovative projects and solutions to support our shared goals to protect the rights of Asian Pacific American workers and all workers. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Secretary, I want to thank um, and every, all my colleagues here at the Department of Labor. We want to thank all of our speakers and workers who have come forward and shared your stories. It's your commitment. Um, it's your hard work on the front lines. It's your courage that, um, that certainly is an inspiration for all of us. And we are going to do as much as we possibly can to work with you and assist you. Um, and we're, we're, we're so happy that you took the time here to share all of this information with us. Um, you should know that you have partners at the Department of Labor. Um, and now I'd like to open it up for discussion. And I think the secretary, um, I think um, Nancy, the secretary would like you to talk a little bit about you, you, um, your We Can Help campaign and wage theft. Yes, yes, if you would, Nancy, please. Right. Um, I'd be this happy is to. Nancy Lepping, uh, my colleague who um, heads Wage and Hour. Um, thank you all for coming. It's, um, Hold the mic up, would you, Nancy? Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, some, some of what you said is, is news, but much of what you've said is things that, you know, the department is aware of and under the secretary's leadership are working to put the pieces in place to to be a, to be more responsive to um, in in that effort um, to, um, particularly in the the to uh, provide employees with a voice in in the workplace and to understand 
that they do have rights and that there are people, whether at the Department of Labor or in many of your organizations, to provide them with assistance, often you need to know first that you have those rights uh, and uh, to go then and seek help. So in that effort, the, the Wage and Hour Division of the Department of Labor uh, created a, this public service campaign to uh, called We Can Help to provide information, very very uh, accessible information to uh, focused at primarily workers um, to let them know that they do have rights with regard to wages and hours and the Department of Labor is um, there to assist them in a better understanding those rights and to also help them um, enforce those rights. And this campaign is in multiple medias, uh, both written, uh, television, you know, billboard um, kinds of campaigns. We're working with various organizations to allow for sort of uh, video and other kinds of things where it can be played over and over again. It's, we are working to put it out in multiple languages, including um, Chinese, Vietnamese, allow um, uh, Filipino um, languages and, uh, and as many dialects as we can. And in that effort, we've also built on our very strong uh, recruitment of, of investigators that are proficient in, in languages other than English and have begun to, I think, 60 percent now of the investigators in Wage and Hour are fluent in a language other than in, in addition to English. And so that is really making it so that not only is our face in the We Can Help, but then when people actually call us that, you know, they are able to speak with someone that, that has, can, is able to communicate with them. We also have put on board a, a language translation service that will also, to, to the extent that we don't have proficiency in a language in a particular office or region, that we are still able to communicate um, with people who come to us for help. So um, the other aspects of the We Can Help is a specialized website um, that is very much catered to workers understanding what's involved in filing a complaint, what kind of information it would be helpful to have in advance of, you know, making contact with Wage and Hour so people, when they do make that call, they, they have more information about what the process will, will involve. Um, and so we have a, a special website that's just the We Can Help that pulls it out of otherwise, you know, lots and lots of information that is hard, sometimes difficult to navigate. Um, so the whole purpose of this is to is to encourage people to give them enough information so that they can they know that we are a place uh, where they can acquire a gain assistance, um, and of course that's being coupled with a reinvigoration of our uh, in our our agency as an enforcement agency and um, looking at and reinvigorating many of the tools, whether the hot goods that was particularly effective in garment and liquidated damages and other, other strategies, uh, particularly looking at like the top of organizations that create the incentives to, to uh, put pressures down the chain. And obviously a lot of information and effort in the area of the misclassification of workers, which is a another strategy, of course, of an uh, effective vehicle to, to basically sweat labor at, at the bottom. So um, this is wonderful to be here today um, and uh, have taken many notes um, based on what you've been saying, just to be certain that we haven't missed anything in, um, in as we're actually in the process now of planning our enforcement strategies for the next several months and, and year. Uh, to be certain that we haven't missed, you know, any opportunities or any strategies that would be available to us. So thank you very much. Can I have a quick comment? Sure. I appreciate that so much, Nancy. And I just wanted to say, um, certainly we have seen the difference already between this administration and 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 the 
whether the doors of the Department of Labor were open. Uh, for right. many, many years, basically, in Los Angeles at least, we decided it wasn't really worth um, making any complaints at all to the Department of Labor. And so we're really excited that, for example, Assistant District Director in Orange County is now Paul Chang, who is bilingual, who comes out, you know, we met 15 years ago when he was an investigator, and he clearly gets both the direct employer employee workplaces as well as the much more complex um, ways that sort of people at the top try to hide their relationship with workers. And I, I was just going to suggest that because the charge of wage and hour is so broad, it seems that a deliberate division between the, uh, the more Im uh, employer-employee, clear employer-employee relationships, Walmart-type cases, where someone clearly works for that employer and there are FLSA and other violations going on, versus what we often refer to in shorthand as the underground economy, although, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the subcontracting, lease contracting, all of these industries where workers are called something else. Mm -hmm. It seems that having, making sure that there's expertise in both of those is so critical, not just at the, at the highest levels of the Department of Labor where we are now, but in each office, because unless there's people expert in both who understand the dynamics of both, it's very, very difficult, even for your outreach, to tell workers what their rights are. Because many workers will tune that out if, they're, if they believe we're not a worker. Any, we're, we've been told over and over again, we're not a worker. We're not protected by those laws. So th I think even the education of workers, but certainly having people on the ground, the investigators, from the investigators to the people who run the offices, understanding that there's two, there's at least you know, two ways to look at the low wage, vulnerable workforce. For Asian Americans, we populate both types of workplaces so much that in different parts of the country, you may not need an equal amount of focus in each, but certainly in large immigrant populations like the ones that are represented here, each, each district should have expertise in both types of workplaces. And, they, and that's the only way that both, um, both, both, both types of, uh, you know, work, workforces will be, will be addressed. And then the, the second related piece is I feel like the Department of Labor, and certainly through Wage and Hour, ought to launch a massive anti-retaliation campaign. Because I think what everybody has said, and, and it's we see it every single day, is that the Department, it's not just because of immigration, but that's one piece, is that if workers feel like they are going to be targeted, unemployed, blackballed for reporting, they were, their, their, their fear is greater than any, um, you know, the, the, any, the trade off is too great for them to come forward. And so I think that for this, especially with this secretary and this kind of leadership, just being able to say, anti, we, we do not, any type of retaliation is unacceptable. Not just if you report to the DOL, but if you directly report to your employer, if you come to a public hearing and talk about, retaliation occurs at all of those levels for workers. And to have the federal government saying that is unacceptable. We, 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 we retaliation in any form against any kind of, you know, whether you call a worker or an independent contractor is not acceptable. I think that that message is not out there for workers, and this is the time to do it. And actually, oh, go ahead. Sure. Yes. Um, I think what Julie said is really critical. At the same time, uh, we really need to have a comprehensive approach. Department of Labor cannot be seen as an enforcement agency only. It really needs to be a comprehensive education, leadership development, so that especially low-wage workers, have to have, need to exercise their rights and collectively. So Department of Labor needs to be seen more, you know, in ally way, the community-based okay. organization. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, th thank you both. And um, I, I just wanted to underscore what Julie was saying, particularly like with a the AAPI community. If they are told that they're not a worker, they're an independent contractor, then the assumption is that's what they believe. Because many of the people that they work for may also be immigrants who are Asian, um, and so they that's not they don't they don't even question it. So we're, there's a lot of that education that needs to go on. Um, but I also just wanted to point out that the language proficiency and language access is so absolutely critical. And um, because OFCCP, the agency that I work at, is hiring 200 people, one of the things we're trying to do is hire language minorities so that we have people who are being the, who are the compliance officers who have the language profi proficiency who can then actually kind of do the outreach, do the investigations, conduct the investigations. So if you know of people who want to come work at OFCCP, you should let us know. Um, 
And we're also working very much not only on AAPI issues from in terms of immigrant workers, but also the whole range for under the executive order, and also discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, which is kind of a you know just a much broader as well as representing all workers, including undocumented workers. So there's a lot going on, and I think that's going on throughout all of um, the agencies. What I'd like is I could, if I could ask uh, my colleague, the Deputy Assistant Secretary from ETA, um, to talk a little bit about what ETA is doing right now. So, Jerry? Um, uh, I, I've been asked to talk a little bit about what we're doing, but principally around the oil spill. And I, I apologize for being a little late. Um, but I think the issues that you have just opened up are, are very applicable. Um, the administration has uh, just sent up uh, a piece of legislation because the authorizing legislation that we have right now requires uh, uh, a, an emergency declaration for us to be able to provide special unemployment assistance to workers who would not qualify for unemployment insurance, all of the independent fishermen who are contractors down in the Gulf and others who perhaps may load boats or equipment or take off uh, equipment uh, and, and fish um, uh, and, and others. So what we have proposed is to create a new federal program of unemployment assistance that would be delivered by the states in partnership with the states for workers who are unemployed as a result of the oil spill, uh, as a result of a spill of national significance. And this is the difference. It's not a, a, the formal declaration. And who have no entitlement to other unemployment assistance. So that proposal went up uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday uh, uh, to the uh, Congress. Um, and assuming that this is enacted following the enactment of it, states will have an option to participate and must enter an agreement to this with the secretary to administer that program. And it's designed to operate very similarly to the program that we have now called Disaster Unemployment Assistance under uh, the particular Stafford Act. Uh, and the only difference is that the states will work collaboratively with the responsible party. Uh, uh, and that to eliminate the duplication of payments, uh, to set the stage for the responsible party's reimbursement of costs, uh, to states for the administration of the program, uh, and for the claims played as well as services uh, uh, through the federal uh, government as well. And uh, it will require uh, other, another agreement with the secretary and the responsible party in the states to figure out how to minimize duplication, if you will, duplicate payments, and establish uh, some time frames uh, to meet the costs uh, that are incurred. So eligible individuals would be people who are unemployed, as I said, as a result of the oil spill and uh, have no rights to any other state or federal uh, unemployment compensation. And this serves everyone who is self-employed. So we think this is very important, and it leads into the, the next thing we're doing, which is we've proposed amendments under this legislative uh, proposal to provide individuals, families, and small businesses with the, that are affected by the oil spill with quick and easy access to information and services and offer employment and training services to facilitate economic recovery. So it amends our current act so that states can apply for uh, oil spill related national emergency grants. And what's important about this is the approach is no wrong door and try and reduce all the bottlenecks. So it would uh, provide, it would enable states to increase the capacity of their uh, one-stop delivery systems, whether it's the those paid for by the Department of Labor Act or whether they're community uh, organizations, whether they're social service offices, whether they're post offices, but to expand access to information and services that individuals need. Actually, we learned that the local areas uh, in Louisiana, oh, two Saturdays ago, which was right after the spill, 
they had already decided that they were going to bring into their one stops down in the affected counties or parishes, excuse me, um, uh, social services so that people could apply for food stamps or, or SNAP uh, as it's known now, uh, that they could apply for Medicaid if they needed that for their families. They could get information on how to uh, apply for unemployment insurance or apply to the responsible party for insurance. So in essence, trying to figure out a way to build on what states and local communities are doing. And one of the biggest uh, concerns that we had, and, and actually OSHA uh, 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 workers down on, on the on sites, uh, uh, as well as the governors and our workforce system said, uh, uh, they they really were supporting what Secretary Solis had been so concerned about. She said to us, make sure that the information and the training is provided in the language appropriate to the individuals, and make sure that you get the message across to everybody that they should be hiring those local affected individuals. So this has gone out loud and clear, and um, OSHA has uh, provided some of its initial information to go through the, our one-stop service system as well as the training in Vietnamese, which is very important in Louisiana, Spanish, which uh, is uh, quite important in uh, Mississippi, and uh, Tagalog, uh, which is the third language which, which is coming up. So we just wanted to let you know those are some of the things that we're trying to do now to make sure people have access to information and services. And for those of you that have uh, connections and, 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 and can get information back to us, keep feeding the information here. We need to make sure that this is working for everybody. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jerry? Yes. I have a question too. Some of the service organizations. Okay. Um, hi, I'm again. I'm Nancy Chen. I'm the regional administrator of the Women's Bureau, and uh, I want to thank you for all your wonderful presentation. And as I was listening to you, um, the first thing I thought was uh, the Women's Bureau was created um, 90 years ago uh, by Congress exactly for the reason was to protect women uh, who were exploited in the workshop uh, in the sweatshops. And uh, here in the 21st century, we are still hearing about the plight of these women. I mean, uh, and we uh, first I want to thank you for all your services. I also want to ask uh, uh, Julie and uh, Young and uh, uh, Lillian, because you serve a lot of women for domestic workers. Um, the Women's Bureau in Chicago, years ago, I would say nine years ago, we worked with the Wage and Hour a great deal actually doing outreach, educating uh, immigrants and women on workers' rights. And one of the things that we heard was that, you know, you probably work a lot with uh, your community-based organizations, you know, whether it's Chinese community, Korean community, Filipino communities. Um, there's a sense uh, from these uh, 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 workers' justice centers telling us is that, um, these communities, the community-based organization, while they are very eager, say, providing educational workshops on immigration, on other legal uh, matters, but very reluctant in talking about the workers' rights, especially on the wage hour issues, because their supporters, their patrons are the ones, the, the violators of these laws. So. Um, I, I just wonder whether that happens to, to you and how do you handle that? Because I think it is important that in addition to working with the Department of Labor, that it is very important how that we can disseminate that information throughout our, our communities and that certainly community-based organizations are the great resources that if they can cooperate and work with us. So, so my question is that actually not just three of you, anyone can answer that. How do you work with uh, organizations to dissem disseminate and ask them to cooperate to, to help uh, to educate the workers? Does anybody want to? Well, we don't um, actually have very close relationships with the owners of these home care facilities. And um, we have been trying to work through the church uh, in that community. There's a uh, Catholic church where the parishioners are like 80% uh, Filipino. And probably both the owners and the workers attend this church. Um, the priest at this particular church is very sensitive to the needs of workers and has 
um, been um, encouraging in terms of of um, coming to us when workers come to him about you know violations. We've also just done some door-to-door -door stuff, um, some kind of undercover of of a potential patron for this this facility, um, tr just trying to get to know some of the workers, and we do outreach to these workers through um, any networks that might exist between them of um, you know personal relationships. So we, we don't, I mean, in terms of our own work, we don't see that as a contradiction. You know, we don't find that there, there is, um, um, well, we don't care if we <laughs> offend the owners uh, because we're, we're really um, more concerned about the more vulnerable in the, pop, in the community. Um, actually, if, before we start taking some questions from um, people who are listening outside of this room, I was wondering if, if Phil, um, Tom, you could talk a little bit about um, your new project here because it's really, I think you'll be the person working with a lot of our, a lot of our, um, a lot of the advocates here. So if you could talk a little bit about your launching of your. Okay. Well, I'm in week seven of my new role, <laughs> so uh, I'll talk from that uh, experience. Again, working with the Office of Public Engagement, uh, Dr. Lemus. Um, we're, as the Secretary has directed, our work is to reach out to all the advocacy, Worker Justice Center, faith-based and community organizations that are addressing worker justice issues. So um, as has been said by Julie, you know, we're trying to share the news with all of our colleagues that you have a friend now at the Department of Labor uh, and that we are looking to develop, you know, uh, working partnerships both at the local level, regional, and national level. Again, how to strengthen that relationship with our DOL partners along with all of your partners. Again, how to, how to really develop a, a much more coordinated, effective outreach strategy with your organizations and with workers. And so we welcome the conversation. We welcome opportunities to partner with you. And again, to work with OPE, uh, the Office of Public Engagement, and all of our colleagues. So again, we've been working wage and hour, OSHA, ETA, and others to say, how can we work collectively together to strengthen our working relationship with all of you and again, with our partners uh, at, the, well, at the local, regional, and national, and statewide levels. So that's that's week seven. <laughs> well, we, and we just want to highlight and underscore, first of all, how happy I am that, that Phil is here with, with Ben Siegel to work on this. But this is an ongoing dialogue. This is just one of many several conversations we hope to have. And we really need you to keep us informed and let us know what's happening on the ground. And Phil is one, one way, one conduit, but you should you know feel free to contact any of um, the agency heads and their deputies. Um, I think we probably ought to take a, a couple questions from the web chat. So um, I'm just going to read this, and then whoever can address it, please do. Amy from Los Altos, California, asks, what is being done to address hepatitis B in terms of educating and testing AAPI workers? Uh-oh. Maybe I shouldn't have picked that question. <laughs> you want me to briefly, Pat? Because I, yeah, sure. I just came from a um, World Hepatitis Day uh, event at HHS. Oh, yes, Karen, so, please do. Uh, I'm by no means the expert, <laughs> uh, but my understanding is that uh, Dr. Koh is leading that effort. He's the Assistant Secretary for Health, and he has made it a priority in his agency and created an interagency working group. Um, there are a number of barriers, uh, both cultural and just uh, really are just around education. Uh, it's, uh, it is an uh, um, infectious disease that, that is preventable um, if there's more uh, education around getting screened, understanding the disease, and, um, and making sure that, uh, that community members are, are, are screened and tested. Uh, wh one thing that was really interesting, I recently did a, uh, a web chat with Secretary Locke for API Heritage Month, and uh, we threw out a statistic that uh, 50% of chronic Hep B uh, patients are Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander. 50%. So, um, and at the at the uh, event, uh, one individual talked about how she had, I think, three members of her family perish from the from the uh, disease because of lack of understanding and screening. So, um, I, the effort is coming from HHS. And so, uh, at least for the department here to know about it, and they're, they're, they are doing a lot of their education through community health clinics, which is going to be the route specifically um, uh, for, for getting that information out. But they are really ramping up and making it more of a priority. So, Okay, yeah. great. 
I just wanted to add our own experience. Mm -hmm. We have um, health fairs regularly at airport taxi lots. Um, you know, it's the one place where you have thousands of drivers waiting online to be dispatched. And we partner with various um, community clinics and local hospitals and private practitioners who volunteer their time. We're actually planning to have two more coming up th this year. But I, if, I could, if I have the floor, if I could just make two quick points. Um, in relation to, um, to Phil's work, I wanted to say particularly for the South Asian community, I think it's really important work because right now, um, particularly, you know, I think South Asians and Arabs and Muslim workers feel a tremendous sense of being under fire. And, you know, um, I think going back to what Julie had said earlier, that we need to separate immigration you know, enforcement from, from the work of the DOL. Similarly, I think in spaces like mosques, where you have a lot of homeland security presence, and you, I think DOL really needs to be present there to say to, to, say to, the, you know, to the men, and partic you know, primarily men who enter those spaces, that you know, we don't see everybody as a terrorist that workers have a right to stand up for themselves and that you know by i think by cat by making people feel really racialized particularly in this very sensitive time period that they're less likely to really come forward and i know south asians on top of that are also one of the newer immigrant communities and you know not only um in the asian community largely but but generally speaking, within the U.S. And so you have a lot of people who, where there is less um, English proficiency, and then I think to, to be so racialized and to feel so targeted in, in this particular time period. And it is also one of the communities that really dominates some of the most low-wage and dangerous professions. Um, and so I would really urge the DOL to make a particular effort to really, um, to really reach out to South Asian, Arab, and Muslim workers in, in this particular time period. And lastly, I just wanted to say, on the question of misclassification, I you know the point that we would make is, see, we think if we went to the NLR to the NLRB, they would tell us we're not misclassified. So our concern is that there are workers out there who, you know, will still be deemed as non-employees, but and, it, and that may not be a misclassification, but what's important to us is that we're still treated as workers, that even if we're not employees by any stretch of the imagination. And so I would really implore the DOL that when you... Um, when you look at these other categories of workers, yes, there are those that are genuinely misclassified, but then there are also others like us who we don't think we would pass that test, but we still believe that our rights as workers should be asserted in the industry. Thank you, Barbie. Thank you. I'm, actually, I was just going to ask my longtime friend and colleague, Karen Narasaki, if you wanted to share some words of wisdom on issues that you'd like us to address. I don't know if they qualify as words of wisdom, <laughs> um, but we do have a concern. I think the one place where DOL uh, needs to be thinking about in terms of immigration is helping ICE to better target the enforcement that they're doing. It doesn't make sense for them to be going after employers who are paying good wages, whose workers are unionized, who are not, in fact, exploiting their workers. Uh, and making them the high priority to look for undocumented workers and doing raids there. You, with your wage and hour, I'm sure have a, a hit list of uh, employers who are, are uh, unscrupulous, who really should be moved up in the targeting list because when, when the immigration enforcement is being targeted at the good employers who may have some issues around hiring and document as opposed to the employers who are really using that to pay uh, below wage, you know, below the required wages, who are not paying overtime, who are not providing safety, it sends a very bad message to the workers, uh, and and I think inhibits your ability to be able to carry out your mission. And the second thing I want to raise is, um, you also will be engaged in the policies around the Workforce Investment Act. Uh, and there, it's really important. We've talked a lot about language access, and it's so great to hear you are really focusing the int intention on that. The other side of the coin is to help us get the workers uh, who are able to learn English to get 
the kinds of services that they need so that they are less vulnerable, so that they can move up the wage, uh, uh, wage ladder. And so as we work towards uh, uh, looking at that act and reauthorizing that act, we'd really like to work with you to make sure that the adult English language provisions can really work for the community. There's a lot of need for uh, reform as well as a need for obviously more resources. And finally, I just wanted to applaud the administration for putting a lot more investment in enforcement on both civil rights and labor law enforcement. It's great and anything that we can do to, to help you in that mission, we would love to do. Well, Go, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Karen, uh, thank you so much. Your points are well taken. And if I could just share with the group here, we have undertaken uh, a review now of uh, prior practices that uh, existed in the Clinton administration with respects with respect to DHS and DOL and how we do our labor investigations. And we're working out um, right now as we're speaking uh, some of the uh, wording and how that will be worked out. We're hoping that we'll have a positive outcome and we'll certainly keep you abreast of that. And I should mention also that we have, if you're not aware, I don't know if our staff talked about it, the utilization of the U visa also for workers that, uh, you know, obviously some of you here are familiar with that. But we'll be um, presenting our protocols in the summer and that will be available too for many of your, your uh, associates and friends that need to be more aware of that. So we'll be happy to allow for our staff to even come and speak to your groups. If there's a forum that we can participate in, we'll gladly do that. We've already talked about also having, in the context of a larger uh, gathering of um, APIs as well as our wage and hour OSHA, kind of a, a similar event that we did in Houston targeting the, the vulnerable workers, Latino workers. We, we understand the, the importance of also focusing in on this community and really just enlarging our base and having you as our advocates because you also are our voices, our ears, and you can also help our staff then better target uh, where we make those uh, decisions to go out and investigate. So that's important. And then the, the other thing you said that was very, very important was WIA, WIA reauthorization. And believe me, um, this last cycle of funding through uh, the Recovery Act monies, we've been able to target sp particular communities, communities that have, for example, we call it pathways out of poverty where 15 percent or higher unemployment is, and you naturally capture the groups that, that are most vulnerable. We want to do more of that. We would love to have more support on that. And if you're interested in hearing about that, I'm sure our ETA staff can get that information to you. There's a lot of funding that's available right now, too, that will be coming up. There's about um, $2 billion that will go through uh, the TAA, the um, Trade Assistant Adjustment <coughs> Programs, monies that will be funneled through community colleges. We are asking for uh, CBOs and groups to be partners with them. So a lot of what you can do is help us in, in providing assistance, whether it's workforce uh, related literacy, obviously that is a big factor in our in our community. So, I mean, we really do want to have your input. And if you could put things in writing to us, that would be very helpful because we're going through that uh, phase right now, and, and um, I think that would be very helpful. So. It has a bill around adult English language mm -hmm. learning and immigrant integration that has a lot of good ideas in it. So that would be great. And uh, just to let you know, the Civil Rights Community, one of our priorities for the coming year is to try to address the Supreme Court's decision in Hoffman Plastics, which yep. Yep. undermines the ability to organize yep. the workforces with undocumented immigrants in it. We hope that you will make that one of your priorities as we work with you, because as we all talked about, uh, if we can't, if we can't really help these communities organize and speak for themselves, they're going to continue to be vulnerable. And if I could just, in, in closing, because I have to run to another meeting, is just emphasize that our the programs that we're undertaking, these new outreach campaigns that we can help, as we've labeled them, um, we really are, I'm coming out very strongly saying that we are enforcing our laws, and the labor laws of our country provide protection for all workers that are in this country legal or if they have a if they have a migration uh, issue it doesn't matter we're there to protect them so i if you could help uh, amplify that message and work with us uh, we would love to have your support and and then work with you closely so you can work with our staff at the regional level out where you're where you're located so i'd really appreciate that for the message isn't quite as consistent as your very very strong message that we applaud you for mm -hmm. thank you okay um, I know the secretary has to go, but if people have time, we could stay a little bit past three because I know there's other people who want to make comments. Is that okay, secretary? Yeah. Um, before Mary Beth, right before you, 
Did you want? Yes. So, um, again, my name is Zoe Khan. I'm with a national organization called the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. We also work with populations from Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. So I want to applaud the administration for all its work in New Orleans and also BPSOS, um, just because they're, they're, they've not only been working with Vietnamese fishermen, but Cambodian and Laos, so recognizing the other languages of the fishermen there and the needs there. But I wanted to piggyback off a couple of things that just been said, which is around WIA. And I'm, I'm really glad someone from ETA is here, because I think we're interested in him maybe having a separate conversation so that community-based organizations who are running a lot of WIA programs on the ground can really tell you about some of the barriers and challenges they're seeing. Uh, so for example, in their placement of people on jobs, they're now having to place people 30 minutes or an hour away from their families and transportation is a tremendous barrier and that's been something that I think we'd like to bring up to the department as an issue to, to kind of funnel through and think about. Um, in addition, I think just, just hearing more about, actually I didn't even know all of these things were going on in the Department of Labor, so hearing more about how opportunities can happen for our local community-based organizations to be engaged and that, that might be in, in our sense a couple of ideas around even a small conference call around grant opportunities or target assistance about how they can apply for grants, that kind of stuff I think would be really helpful for our local groups. Well, so. we would be happy to listen to the ideas uh, as well as the issues that you, you that we need to be sensitized to. So that would be great, both on for WIA, how do we make it work better for individuals and small businesses, but also how do we, you know, what what how do we more engage the communities in that? So that let's can we work on that? Yeah, absolutely. Mary Beth. Yeah, just really quickly, Pat. But, um, I just wanted to thank Amato for the invitation to DOL to participate in the National Asian Pacific Islander Workers' Rights Hearing that you guys had several months ago. It was amazing. I mean, it was over 400 people. The testimonies were powerful. Um, and so thank you for reaching out to us on that and for organizing it. And to say, we will take you up on the offer of joining you in the field at these field hearings. Um, and one of our follow-up, you know, that we'll work to get regional DOL folks there to hear those stories. And one of the things that we might want to also look at as a follow-up, um, working with Cindy as follow-up even to this meeting, is getting that schedule of those other meetings out to all of these groups, right? Because I, I do think that the power of workers telling their own stories and bringing that out of the shadows and into the, you know, into the light for the public, for the media, for our own DOL staff is incredible. So we'll work with you um, to make that happen. Um, and then if you'll just uh, indulge me as well, I want to say it's great to have Hui here from Jobs with Justice, and that I just have to say that um, Sarita Gupta, National Director of Jobs with Justice, would be with us today. The only thing that kept her away was having her daughter, uh, Soraya, born at 2 a.m. this morning. Um, but just wanted to say her name into the room at this kind of historic meeting um, on, on API workers' rights here at DOL. So. Um, my colleagues, uh, Elmi Bermejo and, and Jerry, had to, had to leave. They are going on an oil spill call. So um, um, are there any more comments? Yes, Lillian. Um, I think I brought this up with Dr. Lemus at the um, conference that we were both at a few weeks ago, and, um, and that is to um, recognize the intersection between the Department of Labor and um, the immigration reform that is being um, contemplated, uh, introduced, and the the really negative impact that that will have on a lot of immigrant workers, um, with the increased criminalization of immigrants and the um, you know things like the national ID card, all of those things. I mean, that's that's just going to complicate further what we're already trying to deal with on the ground, and um, to the extent that the the department ca can talk to the um, sponsors of, of this bill to um, get it out of the bill um, would be really appreciated because I'm, I'm not looking forward to that, that debate and that legislation being introduced. We're aware of it. <laughs> Painfully so. Yeah, we're, yes, Dr. Singh. Yes, uh, now I'd like to touch upon the uh, labor trafficking work that we have done over the years. Uh, back in 1999, we, work on, we broke the case that turned out to be the largest labor trafficking case ever prosecuted by the federal government. It involved Dewu Salmak and Samoa. And since then, there continue to be more workers from overseas being imported to the U.S. Um, to, to do farm work or welding, uh, from, not only from Vietnam, but also from mainland China and the Philippines and other countries. And we have observed uh, several phenomena here, phenomena. 
One is contract switching. So they were signed, asked to sign a contract in their own language in the source country. And as they arrive in the U.S., there's another contract they have to sign. Second, um, some of the contract provisions are actually violations of human rights uh, using the U.S. standard. The Vietnamese government, for instance, imposed that these workers sign a contract saying that they may not join a labor union in the U.S. They may not get into a romantic relationship with an American. They may not marry an American or local. They may not be pregnant while working in America. So I call on the Department of Labor to look at those contracts. Because clearly, these are, are violations. There's also fear, because uh, in several cases they will work on in Houston as well as in, uh, in Hawaii, uh, these workers were offer in the contract, $15 an hour for eight hours work, but actually they got paid only $10 an hour. And yet they dare not come forth because they had already incurred huge debt in that country. They already mortgaged off their homes and farmlands in that country. So now if they come forth, the best they could do is to get maybe their back wages and then send back to Vietnam. And they will lose everything in Vietnam because more, many of them came here as seasonal workers, and they were promised that they will stay for three years. Actually, we know that they are not going to stay for three years, but they didn't know. So they, they agreed to pay a huge sum of money in order to, uh, as service fee, to come to this country, and now they cannot go back to that country. Yes. Workers work for federal contractors? Well, no. They, I, I don't know. Actually, okay. that's... Because of Mainly one of in, in farmlands, in, in farm work, like picking apples, pineapples, et cetera. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to just put out there is that many employers are federal contractors. And OFCCP, for many, many years, was kind of, no one ever really looked to OFCCP as an enforcement agency. But particularly very large, contra uh, large employers, I bet you they have a federal contract. Mm -hmm. And although they may not be violating the law, you need to see OFCCP as an enforcement agency that's just as viable as the EEOC because you can file a complaint individually, you can bring credible evidence to me as the director mm -hmm. and I can initiate a complaint, or we can find out, um, find out about violations through our audits because federal contractors have to comply with affirmative action plans and they have to ensure that they're not discriminating. And that is oftentimes could be a very effective mechanism for enforcement because it's not just getting people back pay. We can actually do interim measures like debarment. So please keep that in mind when you're thinking about discrimination under uh, the executive order. It very much parallels discrimination under Title VII. Um, and disability-based discrimination or discrimination based on vets. Finally, I just want to mention, even though we're very young and we've being reestablished, uh, I think uh, a, a good uh, sense of the work we do is uh, the fact that we have uh, Mia Saika Chen on our staff down in the Gulf. Uh, when we started getting complaints um, from community organizations about uh, the lack of translation and interpretation services, uh, a host of other things, mainly initially from BP, but also understanding that the federal agencies um, needed a lot of support as well um, because they were dealing with very, very big issues down there. And uh, um, But we didn't want uh, what um, happened to the, uh, to the Asian American fishermen uh, post-Katrina to happen to them again, many of them still recovering. Uh, both mentally, emotionally, and, and psychologically. So uh, the idea of conceptually the initiative ensuring you know increasing access and participation to federal resources, we could be up here physically in DC. We could also just be on the ground in New Orleans. So just to, it doesn't mean that we are just here, but the idea that uh, whether it's in language access, it's a huge piece. I want to recognize OSHA because after the training they had yesterday, Mia called me and said, you know, OSHA, even though there are issues that you're dealing with, with BP and making sure that the training is actually uh, 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 appropriate for for the fishermen there and not sort of at a certain level and, 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 and hard to understand, um, she commended the effort and the, the genuine concern that individuals had on the ground. So I wanted to recognize 
um, your effort and that really saw you all as an example for what the materials that you had translated. Um, so I do think that uh, we looked at Department of Labor as uh, an example and, and for your leadership with the initiative and uh, we look forward to working together with you and, and the community uh, groups here and the, and, and the national organizations as well and, um, and I do uh, strongly believe that uh, you know the first important step is, is, is about relationships and building that trust and having that open door and accessibility. The second part is about what are we going to do and uh, I often talk about our initiative even though it was created during the Clinton administration we're in the implementation phase of what we need to be doing with the initiative. So we do have a sense of the issues, but I know people are looking for results. So thank you very much for, for having us here and, sure. and being able to participate. Of course, and I wanted to just um, give a special kind of shout out and thank you to, to Karen and, and to Kate as well. Um, you've kind of taken this initiative by a storm <laughs> and you've already undertaken a lot, a lot of a lot of work. And it's a very important initiative and it's gonna have significant ramifications for all of the federal agencies. I know that the secretary um, is is supportive um, and whatever we can do and um, so it's it's the first um, step of I think many steps walking together. So thank you both. And then I'm going to turn it all over to Dr. Lemus for closing. Okay, so I'll be short because we've been here a while. Um, thank you. I want to thank you, um, one, you've heard from the secretary on behalf of her. Would, none of us would be here if it wasn't for her. She pretty much picked us all to come here. And as you can hear from her, her words, their commitment is, is there. Um, I also kind of want to do uh, a couple of other things. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for all the work you do. It's incredible, and um, we can't do what we do without you. Right. Um, you are our eyes and ears, and um, you know even. And I've heard um, the secretary say this, and, and the assistant secretaries. Even with all the inspectors in the world, <laughs> um, it, it's never going to be enough. Even if we tripled our budget, we still wouldn't have enough folks on the ground. So you guys really help us figure out how to better target and do a better job. Um, and I also want to thank Cindy because she put this together. Cindy actually works for me, but I think I work for her. Um, <laughs> um, she really is a, a passionate advocate. Um, she's, she's also, she does a lot of my Latino outreach too. I just want to share that. Um, so I want to summarize a little bit because I heard some really important things here and, and I want you to know that we heard you. And, and the first point is on this concept of globalization and the global economy and that it, it what we're hearing is it's led, and we see it, it's led to a redistribution of workforce, not only in general, but in, in specifically in low-wage work. And, um, and uh, in some ways, it has also, because of the nature of the economy and how corporations move, it's, it's changed how things are done. So we have contractors, we have subcontractors, we have all kinds of different levels, and we have false contracts, which I... I'm not sure who said that. You did. Um, and that's something I think that we really need to pay close attention to. Uh, the misclassification issue uh, is critical. Um, we are all definitely uh, working towards uh, doing something. Uh, we're trying to figure out what the best pathways are. A lot of conversations are taking place. Uh, Mary Beth, who left, has, has really been taking the lead on all of that. Um, and the other thing is I think that um, it's it's – clear that the real beneficiaries are, are these big fish out there and we don't really see them being always held accountable and it's oftentimes the the person lower down on the chain and it doesn't necessarily address the problem so these are things for us to think about as we look at the targeting etc the other issue that I heard loud and clear is this and it, it parallels that it's this link between this low-wage segment of workers and immigration and that we must you know, we're, we're going to have to address both together, and, and how that happens is, is going to be complex. Um, we don't actually take the lead on that. It is the Senate. Um, but um, uh, to your point, we will we, we do vocalize our opinions. <laughs> right, Pat? <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> and also that globalization to that point on immigration. It's not just about the movement of corporations. It's the movement of workers. And a lot of abuses are taking place as a result in areas related to safety, wage theft, job insecurity, genderization of jobs, um, and misclassification, as I already mentioned, creations of underground economies. And that's on the upper scale. On the lower scale, we have human trafficking. 
we have indentured servitude and we still see um, modern day slavery, which is something that um, I think we're all very conscious of. Uh, like the Secretary said, we were in Immokalee and, and we were there at a museum on modern day slavery that just was formed. Mm -hmm. um, so these things are alive and uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna say they're well. Um, I think the other concept we heard a lot about is this concept of emer emergency situations and crises and how we handle that. And that's something that we're gonna continue to figure out as we move forward. In terms of solutions and next steps, um, I think we all have uh, our homework. Um, I think we're looking at review of agency outreach. This is already going. Review of regulations, as you've all suggested. I think this will this will continue. Um, you've heard there's been hiring of bilingual and multilingual staff. That will also continue. I think we also need to raise awareness, not only um, externally but internally, about how important language and culture is. Uh, so um, we can move forward. Um, I mean, there's a lot more issues. Um, oh, well, this is important. I also want to share with you that watching us via web stream are more than 900 of the AAPI community and friends uh, watching this event. So. Um, Welcome, <laughs> but we're closing. <laughs> um, I think um, I'm just gonna wrap up by saying, uh, by raising awareness, we raise our consciousness, and by raising our consciousness, we can begin to find how we're gonna resolve these problems and respond to them in a new, more innovative and creative way. And I thank you, I hope you will continue. We will begin a partnership, this is the beginning. There will be more conversations, and hopefully we will have this regional conference uh, on uh, API and worker safety. Thank you. Thank you.